All right, here we are with another episode of the High Ground, powered by Premier Companies. Sal? We're back again. We're back. Hey, we have a guest with us today from Country Mark, Ash Titzer with, uh, with Country Mark. And we're going to talk about a lot of things on a hot button topics in a lot of people's mind. Uh, so first of all, why don't you introduce yourself, give us your title and background and all yeah. of that interesting cliffhanging information yeah. that you're going to hold for us. Absolutely. Uh, Ash Titzer, I'm Vice President of Production and Midstream for Country Mark. Uh, what that means is production is our upstream department, so it's the actual oil production, you know, lifting the barrels out of the ground, out of the rocks, um, and then midstream is the transportation piece. So the pipelines, uh, crude transportation, trucking, we have a river dock facility, so oversee both of those teams for Country Mark. Um, little background, it's actually great to be back here in Seymour. This is where I got my start in oil and gas. Uh, a little over 15 years ago, I worked for Texas Eastern Pipeline who have a terminal just north of town here. So that's kind of where I got my start. Um, and then uh, moving uh, back home, uh, born and raised down in Warwick County, Indiana. So Country Mark was an opportunity to get me back home. Uh, and it's been uh, an excellent move, and they're an outstanding company. Enjoy every day of it. So Well, great. i tell you what, Ash and, and Ryan, when I think of Country Mark, I think of domestic oil production. And, uh, you know, we don't bring it in. It's not from overseas. It's from from right here in southern Indiana, southern Illinois. And I can tell you for certainty that if we thought we were sitting on oil here in this podcast room, we would put we would drill through this podcast table and uh, pump it right out of the ground here. But when I think of country mark, I think about domestic oil production. Seems like a seems like a simple choice for some Doesn't of the problems it, we're facing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah we're, exactly. It is. It is important. And we're sitting here mid March of twenty two and uh, with current events but let's talk about u.s production and uh, how important that is to have uh, have uh, oil produced and refined locally yeah absolutely so uh if we were sitting on some oil reserves i know a guy to get you a drill bit okay so awesome. <laughs> we'll, call you. Yeah. we'll call you we'll push the table out of the way that's for sure so <laughs> no so um the illinois basin is the um, the primary source of country marks crude oil um the basin produces a little over 30,000 barrels a day, which uh, is the capacity of our refinery. We're not getting every barrel of the basin, but we're getting the majority of them. The rest of the barrels that we purchase and we process, uh, we get out of the Patoka, Illinois crude hub. Those barrels are also uh, produced in North America, primarily the United States. Some may come from Canada, but that's very, very rare. It's okay. very rare. So. So to support domestic crude oil um, in our region, the best thing you can do is buy Country Mark fuel. We, it's 100% North American, American crude. We're producing the products here locally, and we're getting them to market locally. So, I mean, if you, there's no better uh, flagship to produce or to support U.S. energy than buying our fuel if you have that option. And we fly that flag in front of every one of our C stores. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, uh, I know Country Mark's helped us with the branding to put that out there. And, and for those listeners that aren't aware of what we do with, with Country Mark, and that is a wonderful alignment we have with, with that domestic production. Well, it's a, co- it's a co-op, so yeah. you're owned by the Indiana Cooperative System, and that is uh, uh, something that's been very beneficial both ways. And right. so if they're a member of one of the Indiana co-ops, they're also owners of, of Country Mark as well. So it's a nice right. system. Well, I've got a dumb question. So when we talk about oil and natural gas, are those two kind of tied together? How do we get – does, yeah, does they, one they come are. with the other? Is it like a salad with ranch dressing? Or Yeah. yeah, It's not quite like that, but okay. it's pretty close. Pretty, pretty close, close, yeah. 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 So there, there are – they are related. Um, there are a lot of oil wells throughout – or any oil well, but especially throughout the United States that produce both crude oil and natural gas. It depends on the, the geography and the – the reserve, the basin that they're pumping out of, but a well can produce both oil and gas. Locally in the Illinois basin, all the wells are producing oil that goes to market. The gas that is produced locally, we just don't have the takeaway capacity in pipeline or, or truck to gather that gas. So it's, uh, it's flared off, and that's under EPA regulation, and we do that. Um, the cash cow locally is get the – oil barrel out of the ground so. okay are there any future plans to capture some of that natural gas is that just a restriction to being able to, to handle it it's it's all based on the infrastructure okay. it, it is it is and what we found is that 
the oil and gas investments have fallen off drastically in the last several years. Um, we could probably be it, pretty specific with how, <laughs> yeah, how those have fallen <laughs> off. Yeah. So, um, when COVID hit, people quit investing capital. Right. We're still feeling the effects of that throughout our industry and not just locally. Um, folks quit investing in pipelines, not investing in refineries. Right. So setting up that infrastructure on a small scale basis doesn't make a whole lot of sense, you know, to get that gas to market. So we focus on the crude oil. We know that the local crude oil makes the best diesel product, diesel fuel product that you can find anywhere. Our refinery was built to run those local crude, crude oil barrels to make premium diesel. So that's what we focus on. Wow. Yep. The, um, how's this, I mean, obviously we're, well, we got Ukraine and Russia and, and, uh, what's that, what's that going to do? I mean, uh, that's an open ended question, but what, yeah. I mean, so what does that do this global market of oil? Yeah. It, there's a lot of effects of it. Um, what it has done just in the short in two weeks that uh, since the invasion happened um, has driven the crude price, crude markets up uh, over $30 a barrel is what that's done. Globally, uh, we consume about 100 million barrels of crude uh, throughout the world. Russia produces about 10 million of that. 5 million of the 10 that they produce, they put on the global market. So if there's sanctions um, and folks are not wanting to buy their crude, that 5 million barrels a day, uh, it'll affect everybody. Prices will go up everywhere, and we've seen that, right? So the, the risk is there. Um, we can offset it, but it's not as easy as flipping a switch, right? We can offset it by producing more locally, right? If there's wells that aren't turned on, if there are wells that are unfinished, let's get them complete, let's give them to the market, but... That does not happen overnight. That takes some time. Well, let's jump down and talk about uh, where where do the <laughs> who produces oil? I mean, we always think about the Middle East, and uh, yeah. uh, I've, I admitted my ignorance on another podcast about uh, about not knowing exactly how big of a, a grain producer that Ukraine was. Mm-hmm. Um, so, as we talk about Russia and what they produce from a crude standpoint who else who else produces crude and to, to what levels yeah uh we do the united states does um, <laughs> and, we're the, and we're the best at it dang it and that's all that's all that matters all that's right it. i guess that's got this no, so, if you're gonna get it teed up you might as well hit it yeah well like i said not just buying locally here um you know indiana and in the surrounding uh states but it's in the united states you know we Pre-COVID, we were about 13 million barrel a day of domestic production. Uh, that has dropped off. It's about 11 and a half or so. Um, but we consume about 20 million barrels a day in the States. So that eight and a half or so is imported, right? We do import a little bit from Russia. It's not a whole lot. Our biggest import. But it still has to be. That's right. That's it would, right. The eight and a half million barrels a day would still have to we, be. We still need that. Okay. We're consuming that. That's correct. That's correct. But we can get a lot of that from some of our friends. We can get it from ourselves. <laughs> yeah. U.S. crude. <laughs> if, I, if you guys so, don't remember anything else today, we've got <laughs> the ability to do it. But, Ash, what if, I mean, we, I, I quit watching the news, but we were supposedly energy independent just right. a couple of years ago. Uh so we have the ability to make mm-hmm. this other eight, eight and a half million barrels a day, or is that uh, kind of wordsmithing when it's, it was it, energy independent? No, possibly. Okay, possibly. Um, there are benefits to the crudes that we do import. Canada is our largest importer, right? They're bringing in a, a little over four million barrels a day from Canada. Um, Mexico is right behind them. Uh, Russia's back right there around Mexico's numbers. Uh, obviously, that's changing. Uh, and then all the OPEC countries, we get a good chunk of them, a uh, little over a million barrel a day from, from the OPEC countries. You said energy dependent a few years ago. We still exported crude at that time. Um, we brought a lot of crude from Venezuela. Well, Venezuela collapsed, mm-hmm. right? So we're bringing zero in. We've got sanctions on them. So that changed where we sourced the crude. We built up our production, right? But we still sourced. We turned some Canadian production on. So it's, it's always changing, right? Um, the crude that's produced in North America, 
um, with the shell plays that have hit over the last 15 years or so has lightened. So we need some of these heavier crudes coming out of these other countries. And it's just a matter of the, uh, uh, the consistency and the quality of the crude to make our blend make it. To have a blend stock that makes good quality products. Hmm. Okay. So in the United States, where does it come from? We think of Texas. And uh, hasn't been very many years ago. We thought of the Dakotas. Yeah. So uh, tell us about uh, what the names of these basins are. We know the Illinois Basin. Obviously, yep. we live on it. But yep. uh, talk about the basins and where they are yeah. located. Absolutely. So and you have interest in one. We do. We have some oil interest um, down in the Permian Basin and the Delaware Basins, which are in West Texas and New Mexico. Uh, the Permian Basin has been the, the hot spot over the last uh, seven or eight years, I would say. Uh, of our 12 million, 11 and a half million, uh, the Permian Basin's putting out over 5 million of it. So it is, the, it is the hub. The Bakken is the Dakotas. So North Dakota and South Dakota is the Bakken shell play. That's the second. It's a little over a million. And then the third, you bounce back down to Texas. And South Texas is the Eagleford. Um, all three of those produce a lot of gas also. So not only are they heavy crude oil basins, they're heavy gas basins as well. They're capturing that there. They're capturing it there and they're getting it to market. That's right. Um, so I mentioned the Permian basins, a little over 5 million barrel a day. Earlier I said what the Illinois basin was, 30,000 barrels a day. Crude oil production, you know, it's apples and apples, right? But that's red apples and green apples. I mean, it just scale is amazing in some of those basins, hmm. how big they are. Do you, have a, do, you have a, do you know how long that they'll produce like that? I mean, or do we have projections on that? Surely yeah, there's yeah, seismic or something that tells there, us. There's a lot of science. Uh, there's a lot of reserve um, or reservoir modeling and stuff like that, and it's, it's decades and decades. Uh, I believe when the Permian was first found, it was well over 150 years of hot and heavy drilling. Would, would be able to sustain in that area. So, And things play into that. I mean, clearly gas uh, mileage and some yep. of those things that it doesn't take to switch into electric, we're, we're right. reducing that usage today anyway. I mean, there's mm-hmm. some of that going on anyway. So, Well, at the end what, of World War II, I mean, I've been reading a lot of history books, and we were the largest oil produ- producer mm-hmm. in the world at that time. And uh, – you talk about size or scale. Mm-hmm. So I made some scratchy notes here as you were talking that uh, uh, we need uh, 20 million a day. Uh, domestically, we're doing 13 million. Canada's mm-hmm. uh, uh, 4 million of the eight and a half that were short. So uh, then Mexico and Russia. So we need to find about another three or four million gallons. Yeah, locally. locally. Barrels. Barrels. Yeah, barrels. Yeah. Yeah, barrels. M- million barrels a day. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, we have the capacity to do that. Those basins contain that those those volumes of oil. They're there. Um, it's got to make sense to get it out. There's got to be a market for it, right? Um, the markets change. We've seen that our crude inventories or the crude prices are at a 14 year high right now, but the inventories are low, right? Um, the product demand is almost back to normal, pre COVID normal, mm-hmm. right? So all of those levers kind of got to be pulled at the same time. Um, and then it makes sense to get more of those barrels out of the ground. Okay. Yep. You didn't mention Alaska. Yeah, so Alaska produces a lot of oil. Um, in the 70s and the 80s, uh, with the North Slope, they built the, uh, the Alaskan pipeline to get those barrels to market. Um, it was, they were phenomenal numbers of production back in those days. Today, it's uh, just a hair under 500,000 barrels. I think it's a little over 400,000 barrels a day coming out of Alaska. Um, a lot of Alaska is on federal ground, and the current administration had halted uh, drilling on federal grounds. So it was a, that's a that's a fight. Those barrels you we can't touch right now. You know you cannot get a permit to drill. So there are barrels there that you can't even get to market. Okay, well that's comforting to know that someday if we ever needed them, they're there. It's not like we it's not pumped dry. We just can't drill it. That's right. Well, that someday could be in two and a half years. With the new administration. That's right. Because <laughs> we could two years ago. And I've seen, uh, I, I'll never forget what talk about fracking. I was, I was in Fort Worth, Texas, yep. and it was a neighborhood. I mean, it was a neighborhood, and there was something behind a kind of a big canvas screen. Yep. 
And I was within, uh, I think I could have thrown a rock and hit this natural gas well. Right. That was right there in this urban neighborhood. I didn't hear it. And if I hadn't driven straight by it, I would have never known it. Right. Right. It just doesn't seem like that would be too disruptive to to stick a well somewhere. But No, it's not. You know, the uh, from a landowner standpoint and um, from what you see on the surface, uh, the biggest impacts when you're drilling, obviously. You know, you've got a drilling rig, you got crews running in and out of there. Um, when that well's producing, it's nothing more than a pumping unit or a little wellhead. That's all it is. Uh, they are engineered to be extremely safe. Hmm. So there's not, there's the risk um, of an incident is very, very small. You know, we're not seeing oil wells blow up on the news every night, are we? No. So knock on wood. <laughs> no. So it seems like you're all for this domestic production. Yeah. <laughs> You think? <laughs> U.S. oil. And I'm I on think, that yeah. bandwagon, right. too, I think. I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. So let's jump global for a minute. Tell us about uh, what, what direct uh, effects this Russian conflict is having on us. Pricing, obviously. I mean, everybody sees it, right? Um, taking those barrels off the global market um, has changed things. It will change things. I suspect that uh, they'll come back to earth sometime soon, even if the conflict continues on. Um, you know, I don't foresee it being a real long lasting effect. And by long lasting, I mean, you know, 18 months or something like that. We're going to see some high prices in the next few months. Um, it's inevitable. That's good. That, that's here to stay. Um, like I said earlier, we can't really just turn the barrels on overnight, right? Exxon and Chevron, two of the biggest players in the Permian, uh, had a announcement earlier this week that they are going to turn more production on in the Permian. So that will help us. That will help the price go down. And these are wells that are drilled. They're drilled and, and completed. They, and they're ready to just, you can't just flip a switch, but for all practical purposes, they're pump, ready to start pumping. Pump them harder. Okay. Pump them harder. Yep. Yep. Get the barrels out of the ground faster. Right. And then the ones that they have drilled that are incomplete, uh, they'll start completing them. They'll finish those. And then backing up even further, uh, we're seeing drilling down in the Permian and, and everywhere ramp up because drilling makes more sense at a hundred dollar barrel, sure. oil, right? It's easier to do versus thirty. Versus thirty, you got it, you got it. So and the trick is to start drilling today so it's ready in a year or whenever. That's right. Yeah, yeah. No, um, those big wells, uh, you know, these guys down in the Permian, they're drilling two miles deep and two mile horizontal. That takes some time, right? takes time to drill it takes time to complete it so yeah it, it six to eight months minimum to get those barrels out of the ground well as that as that production gets gets ramped up a little bit um we, we talk about or we hear about that the feds are releasing the strategic reserve yeah. the strategic reserve in, in my thought process is there when we can't produce that's why it would be there. It seems like a stupid thing to use while we can produce to manipulate pricing. Yeah, yeah. So or or put us in a bad place when we need it. Yeah, because you would pump it out, then you got to fill it with higher priced oil, or not have it, or, or not, not have, it, or not have it. Right. Um. Yeah, it's called strategic for a reason. <laughs> um. Unfortunately, we rarely use it for strategic manners. Right. Um. They they do this from time to time. We they uh, the federal government has done it twice here recently. When they do it though, they release um, a volume of barrels that is about two days of our national consumption. So really, it has it has no effect on the market. A lot of it is for is for show. It's politics, right? Mm -hmm. We all know politics like the show. Uh, politicians like the show. Um, that's all. We you rarely see. Um, uh, price change because they said we're going to lease 30 million barrels you know we burned through that in yeah, a day, day and, and a half, half right yeah, from so, your, so how many yeah. barrels do we have in a strategic oil reserve you know it's and great. these are caverns that's pumped full right they're caverns um the biggest ones down on the gulf coast uh I'm, i don't know if you can ever find out what it oh, exactly otherwise is. yeah yeah, yeah. You know that <laughs> so um, it's, so just it, to clarify, it's, it's oil that's in the ground that gets pumped out <laughs> to keep from pumping out oil that's in the ground. <clears throat> Interesting when you put it that yeah. way. Yeah, that's a good way. To, oh, that's a good God. way to look at it. I just <laughs> that's no. how I think about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's oil that has been 
produced from a rock formation. You know, it's ready to go to market. It's just stored in a in a yeah. cavern, right? But but no, that's still that's a good way irony. Yeah. Yep. So okay. we talk a well, go ahead. No, I'm just gonna say I've got questions about it. Go yeah. ahead, Ryan. Well, I mean, we talk a lot about barrels of oil, and and I think uh, as we jump around a little bit, uh, let's explain a barrel of oil. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a 55 gallon barrel. I think some of our right. listeners know we've t- we've covered it a little bit. And then what comes out of that? We don't think about that, but then and, and the gallons that are in a barrel of oil, what comes from that yeah. product wise? Yeah. So uh, a barrel is 42 gallons. Well, right? I had that wrong from the beginning. Yeah. 42 Ouch. gallons in a barrel. Um, for country marks uh, production, we make about 20 gallons of that 40 uh, into gasoline. 17 or so of it goes into our diesel fuel streams. Um, and then we make about four and a half for asphalt flux. So that's the bottom of the barrel. And about a half a gallon on the top of the barrel um, is the propane. When I say top and bottom, I'm talking about the gravity of the product. So the lighter end stuff mm-hmm. goes up, the heavier is the bottom. So that's pretty consistent numbers for Country Mark. Um, there are other you know refiners that uh, do a different mix, right? We've got folks that make jet fuel, uh, which is uh, in the diesel stream, essentially. Uh, we've got a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of folks that make the, the propylenes and ethanes or ethanes and stuff like that, uh, real light in stuff. Um, all of it is specific for whatever their market share is, right? Whoever their customer is. Um, obviously, ours is majority of country marks fuels for transportation, you know, road transportation fuels. Um, but in, you can't get more diesel fuel out of a barrel of, of, of crude? That's right. Yeah, that's right. So we try to maximize diesel, mate. Yeah. Right. Um, to support the the members, or, you know, our member owners and the co-ops. Um, you know, tractors run on diesel, right? So that's that's our focus. That's our flagship product is a premium diesel PDX4. So uh, it's interesting. It was looking back um, in 2019, 65% of the oil uh, that we produced in the United States or, or refined in the United States went for other purposes besides road transportation. So only 45% is made into transportation fuels. Uh, the rest of it goes to all different things. Um, plastics, pharmaceuticals, um, paint, coatings, ammonia. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So in 2019, 65% went to other, other purposes than road fuel. That's right. Yep. And I use the 2019 because that's when we were at max. We, sure. you know, that we were at 13 million barrel a day production. I see that you had a note about synthetic materials for clothing. I think yeah. uh, one popular clothing brand became the number one uh, advertiser for a crude oil company by being anti-crude oil because all of their jackets yeah. and, <laughs> and, and, and products were made out of synthetic. So oh my the National gosh. Oil, oil and Gas Industry named them Yep. It named them, I forget how they yeah, said Yeah, so, them. yeah, it was, uh, they kind of um, uh, put their foot somewhere they didn't really need to, right? Uh, it was North Face, and they came out and said, we're anti-fossil fuel. Well, 100% of their products are made from fossil fuels. 100% of them. Oh, so They probably didn't know. I mean. <laughs> they may not have known. They might not have known. <laughs> but literally the day after they came out and said, made this stand, how, you know, look at us, we're anti-fossil fuel. The day after the oil industry said, oh, we, we'd we like to have a conversation with you all. So. It'd be funny to cut, and they awarded cut them off. something. Yeah, they, yeah, they gave them, uh, they only, there are a couple of oil and gas uh, industry <laughs> gave them awards for consuming so much fossil fuel. I wonder so. how many North Face hemp jackets they could grow <laughs> or put together. Right. Oh, my gosh. Yep. So, so uh, it's, I mean, obviously plastics, pharmaceutical stuff like that is in everything, right? So it takes a lot of oil uh, to make all these products. What, uh, I got another question. What a, So the heavier uh, part of the, the oil, mm-hmm. that goes into propane? The lighter part of the, the lighter oil. part, the, yeah. So the lighter, part. yeah. The lighter molecules uh, go into your into your more gas, you know, your propanes, um, and then gasoline is underneath it. So if you think of a forty-two barrel or a forty-two gallon barrel, you stack in your products. You got your propane, your gasoline, then your diesel, then your asphalt on bottom. 
And why's the asphalt? It's 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 a heavier. Just it a, takes a heavier uh, consistency of the oil, a heavier gravity, specific gravity. Okay. Yep. And so propane is just in that refining process. They just. Yep. Yeah, we you know we would love to make more diesel, right? But to make the seventeen gallons of diesel that we make, we've got to make twenty gallons of gasoline. It's just part of the part of the process. Right. And then you said you had to import some different types of oil uh to to satisfy some of these requirements or demands either for gas yeah. or for for mm-hmm. something else yeah so we actually just do that country mark we bring in some oil from from the bakken and the nile Brera, which is out in colorado different different basins um that's just because we don't produce enough oil locally okay that's it it's not uh, necessarily for our product make it's not that you need more asphalt oil or nothing okay that's right that's right okay I got questions. I, I got a lot of questions, but I guess for the the pipeline seems to be real high on the irritation meter yep. and pipelines in general. I guess can you give us a primer on on what the pipelines what what do pipelines do for for the oil industry? Yes, uh, good question. I'm a pipeliner uh, by trade. That's uh, that's what I've I've done for years. Um, I love the industry, and so I'm a uh, I love talking about pipelines, so I can do that all day long. And you can ask my ask my wife; she's heard enough about pipelines. So, um, I can't, ima- pi- I can't yeah. imagine that. Yeah, that that would be a topic of What's conversation that? right now. Pillow talk. Yeah. yeah. Can we talk about oil yeah. and pipelines? <laughs> yeah, she uh, she really loves it. Let me tell you. So, <laughs> no. So pipelines are uh, a mode of transportation, right? Uh, they move barrels, crude barrels, or gas barrels from the well. Uh, to the refinery or processing plant. And then they move the products that a refinery makes back out to market, right? That's what they do. Uh, They are head and shoulders above any other mode of transportation safer. They are the safest mode of transportation, uh, bar none, right? Um, They're also uh, highly regulated. So the Department of Transportation, the DOT, regulates all pipelines uh, in the United States. They have a branch called FEMSA, which is a Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration that specifically uh, regulates pipeline operators, right? Everything that we do as a pipeline operator um, is tied to a regulation. So all of our operations, our maintenance, um, the way that we have to turn a valve, the way that we patrol our right-of-ways, I mean, everything you could possibly think of is because of a regulation our number one goal is is safety right we got to protect the communities that we're running them through you know we've got to protect the environment then we also have to protect the asset itself the pipe has to be safe right to keep the wet stuff inside the pipe right so we spend a lot of time and effort doing those things and for the i mean in all of this whether it's water or or natural gas or or fuel or oil it all shows it all comes through a pipe to a point that's right at some point that's right and like you said it just makes more sense whether to put it in a pipeline than try to pump it into rail cars and i guess the first one that comes to mind we think about pipeline is the keystone yeah pipeline yeah what is the big deal (laughs) with this pipeline so pipelines are political now right that's something that uh, is new in the last 20 years or so um, the reason they're political um, is because of the regulations that we have to adhere to. We have to get permits to build them, right? Um, the Keystone uh, has a lot of hair on it because of the grounds that it, there's, a, there's an aquifer, a major aquifer that it was um, uh, intended to cross, which is drinking water for folks. Um, people have a misconception that pipelines leak all the time. You know, I just said that they're the safest mode of transportation. You know, they don't leak all the time. Unfortunately, from time to time, there is an incident. You know, we try to mitigate that as much as we can. So that's what's driving it is folks are afraid that they're dirty and they're nasty. But they simply are not. You know, that's not the case. And pipelines already go underneath rivers and and lakes and they're, oceans. They're, yeah, absolutely. They're everywhere. I mean, if you, if you look at a pipeline map of the United States, it looks like a spider web. You know, uh, Country Mark, we run uh, liquid pipelines, so it's, it's the gas and the diesels. But across the United States, uh, there's 
over 200,000 miles of liquid pipeline. And then you throw on the gas pipelines, um, it's two and a half million miles. Oh, my gosh. So they are literally everywhere. So, um, yeah, you know, crossing a river, yeah, the, the Ohio River probably has hundreds of crossings. Hope nobody finds that out. Yeah. <laughs> <he protested. laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Uh, do they only go one way or, I mean, tell us a little bit about function. Yeah, right? so um, you can, no, you can have bidirectional, bidirectional. Majority of them are um, flowing in one direction because they are, they're installed to take a product from point A to point B because point A is where it's made or, or and point B is the market or point A is where it's made and point B is the, the production facility. So majority of them are, are going sense. one way. And then there are only ones for gas, ones for oil, ones for um, gas. I mean, tell me what. Yeah. So there's crude oil pipelines, uh, there's finished product pipelines, and there's there's gas pipelines, right? Uh, natural gas. So that's your home heating. Uh, Country Mark, we only have the finished product and the crude oil lines. Our products pipeline, we run different products in. So we will run gasoline and diesel together in the line. How we do that is through a system, uh, a batching system. We call it a batch. Uh, we will put a batch, you know, just for, uh, just to describe it, we'll put like 50,000 barrels of diesel in it, right? And behind that, you've got to push that with something, right? We use pumps, you know, and booster pumps throughout the system, but you got to push it with barrels, right? So you'll put gasoline behind it and then, then a diesel behind it, and it's, it's always moving in that way. We control the mix and the contamination of products through pressure. So we keep a constant pressure on our pipeline. And then we have a uh, control system called, it's a SCADA system. It's uh, supervisory control and data acquisition. And it is an entire system that is constantly monitoring the pumps, the, uh, the pressure, the temperature, everything about the pipeline system. And then we have this, uh, we have a control room down in Mount Vernon, Indiana, that we that we're, we, it's 24 hour manned. And it also has a computer program running in the background. That's watching all that. Right. So it's watching where our batches are, our flow rates, our pressures and everything. It's also running a leak detection program. So if we were to have a leak, we would know it instantaneously. So we could respond. We get the pipe shut down, valves closed and our emergency response folks rolling. Like, what's a, Go back to the batches. How do you keep yeah. them apart? Yeah, what happens when that, What happens when your diesel gets... You know the end of your I diesel's like we're coming get, up. We're going to <laughs> we'll get chocolate and our peanut butter. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what happens? How do you do that? Yeah, so Where does it, it go? It's, it's, it's through the pressure, right? So we, we hold that pressure. There is a little bit of transmix that happens. It's, there just is. There's nothing in between them. It's the, the gasoline and the diesel are... Well, we just... We'll be pumping diesel, and then we'll open a, we'll close the valve that's supplying the diesel and open a valve that's supplying the gasoline, and off it goes. Um, holding the pressure in the pipeline, whatever our pipe's rated for, um, our 8-inch pipe, we run just uh, about 700 PSI. That pressure holds those products as they move. Hmm. There is a little bit of transmix, like I said. Um, we cut that out. And we put it in a separate tank when it hits the terminals. Um, we try to minimize transmix, right? We want good product. Um, we watch the specific gravity change. So I talked about the different products that a barrel makes because of the gravity. Diesel and gasoline have a different qu uh, gravity footprint, if you will. So we'll see a gravity, like a heavy diesel coming in. And we know, based on our calculations, that... Um, the, the batch of gasoline is supposed to arrive at, you know, 14, 30 hours this afternoon, mm -hmm. right? So our folks will be watching that, and they'll see the gravity change. When they see the gravity change, uh, they'll switch the stream into this transmix tank until we hit the gravity of good gasoline. And then we'll switch the stream back into a gasoline tank. And that's not a, a lady or a guy checking the specific gravity with it, a... I mean, it, they don't have to put well, the lab code and what. Yeah, well, they, so it's it's we have instrumentation that does it, but we also double check uh, using our personnel. So there's automation, and then there's, there's double checked. That's right. Wow. Yeah, so our guys will. Uh, we've got a sample shack that has a tiny stream coming uh, through it, and they're yeah they're checking it. They've got thermometers and, uh, and 
and everything right there, and they're checking it. When they see it, boom, we switch valves. Kind of a no smoking area, probably. It's, I would guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you talked about uh, pipelines all through, and we just talked about how you're running product. Uh, how many how many miles of pipeline are you responsible for? Yeah, so we have about 400 miles of pipeline that we operate. Um, it's uh, that consists of 240 miles. I'm sorry, we 400 miles of crude oil pipeline into our refinery. And that's all southwest Indiana, southern Illinois, and a little bit in western Kentucky. But then our products pipeline that leaves the refinery in Mount Vernon heads up north uh, to our Swiss City Terminal, and then our Jollyettville Terminal north of Indianapolis, and then our Peru Terminal up in Peru, Indiana. That's about 240 miles or so. So 640 total that we operate. Well, thank goodness back in the uh, – the, those that came before us were – were brave enough and had the work ethic to get those pipes pipes laid in the ground yeah. and yeah. and we can use them yet today uh, you're exactly right so our products pipeline that feeds the terminals was uh installed in 1953 um we've operated every day since um that that tells you the integrity that those you know the the integrity and uh of the folks that saw that the need for that right and then also reliability in knowing that hey we got to good put a good product in the ground so it'll be here in a hundred years yeah right so so you talked about Switch City Jollyettville and Peru how mm-hmm. much storage do you have at those I live close to the Switch City one and it appears that there's substantial gallons yeah there. Qu- quite a bit so uh, all of them combined is about 1.3 million barrels that we can store so it's it's significant that's uh you know. We talk about buying stuff, it's always in gallons, right? So it's 55 million gallons of product that we can store at our terminals. So, and that's, uh, you know, our terminals are, um, I always kid that, that those are our cash register, right? That's the custody transfer from our product that we make hits the market right there at those truck racks at the terminal. So quality ha- is of utmost importance, right? So when I talked about switching and the transmix and everything, we've got to get it right so we can provide this high quality product to, to our members. You know, the member owners. So to track back just for a minute, you talked about uh, Keystone Pipeline Mm -hmm. and it going uh, around an aquifer. Mm -hmm. So you explained River Dock, that you have a River Dock. So tell us about your River Dock and what it's utilized for. Yeah, absolutely. So we do have a a dock facility there in Mount Vernon. It's on the Ohio Ohio River. It's uh, about a mile away from the refinery process area. Um, It's connected via pipe also, pipelines. Uh, We bring feedstock in off of barges into the refinery. And then we also put uh, finished products back out on the market. So we're flowing in and out of that uh, River Dock facility daily. So it's a, it's a key asset to our system. So I guess my point is is that, that when we talk about pipe and it traveling, people are worried about that. I mean, there's crew traveling on trucks, on trains, and on boats Yeah, all over the country. That's right. So. Yeah, and, you know, trucks and trains um, – those things are more prone to accidents, right? Train cars turn over, trucks can get hit. Um, barges are the are extremely safe, also. But you've got a hydrocarbon product on the on the water, you know. So there's a lot of risk there. And we are not trashing truckers, no, no, no trains, no, or no. or barges. I no. mean, we we rely on trucks. We rely on all of those for fertilizer, grain, and everything. But Absolutely. but it is it it is just a conceptual common sense type issue that yeah. That, that that product's moving. They're not going to stop the product from moving. No, so. a- every day uh, throughout the United States, there's product moving around constantly. And when you put it in a pipeline, you know where it's at, or yeah. on a truck for that matter. But you put something on the railroad track, or the uh, or the on a barge, and it's like you can lose it. We can track everything yeah. else, but you put something. Yeah. Where's that train at? I'm not sure. We lost a train car. Yeah, that's so. That's a huge benefit for Country Mark. Um, we own and operate all of our pipelines uh, and our river dock. Uh, we control them; they're ours, right? So we're moving our barrels. Uh, we have complete control of that. So if we lose some barrels, uh, shame on us, right? Yep. Okay. Well, why don't uh, why don't you just? I don't know if you got anything else for us, but I guess what well, I guess we would want to tout that. Why domestic is local. I yeah. mean, you could close that out again by just just the sheer just cliff note version of why the domestic is, yeah, is the so, way to go. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, as COVID highlighted a couple of years ago, that um, spending your money local is important, right? That's what helps our local economy. Keep your dollars here. You make them here, keep them here, right? Look, you know, the Sitcos and the Exxons of the world, they're going to be all right, you know? 
uh, don't hesitate to pass them up and go buy a country mark gallon, yeah. right? Uh, because the money does stay here, and it goes right back into the, the cooperative system. You know, that's why we're, we exist. That's what we do. So it is extremely important that we do that. You know, you, be, you buy local. Keep your money here. Um, it just generates jobs. It generates a, 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 a strong local economy, and that's, that's what it's all about. Yep. I don't know if there's anything better to finish on than that, Ryan. I have nothing. Well, I tell you what, with that, I know I got more questions, but yeah. we may have this, uh, <laughs> we could turn this into our longest podcast because I've got a lot more questions, yeah, but I for think sure. for interest of time, uh, I tell you, thanks for joining us today in the podcast room. Hope you'll come back and yeah. uh, we can delve into a little, maybe a little deeper into some of the topics, but this is going to conclude another episode of the high ground powered by premier companies. Thanks, yeah. Ash. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Ash. See you. Thanks.